Hey, YouTube friends and family. Welcome back. Just Christina here. Thanks for joining me. Um, I took the rest of the day off. I've been in the dentist chair since 7 a.m. So I'm walking around the backyard trying to walk off my sedation a little bit more. Um, but there's been something that I've been seeing a lot more videos on lately, and that is the magnitude of earthquakes. And people are scared that they don't know when the big one's going to happen and this and that. Well, I just want to talk briefly about a video that I did a year ago on a study that I did more than a year ago. And essentially, I butted heads with my professor pretty big on this and I refused to change my stance. And I didn't get the best grade, but I still, I was not wavering. And I'm still very, very proud of that. So the study that I did was a quantitative study and I had taken data from more than 18 resources, pretty much everything I could get my hands on, including but not limited to the USGS and people might say, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're flawed and they alter their numbers. And yes, they do, but I used every resource point that I could possibly find, including Dutch sins. And that's ultimately what I butted my, butted heads with my professor on because uh, he said it wasn't anchored and it wasn't proven by science. And I said, but it's, it's proven, you know, it's a, it should be the new standard model by all means. Um, and I think that since, um, since the paper that I wrote, I think maybe the USGS has looked to Dutch and his work a little bit more. Um, even though they butt heads, I think they look at his stuff knowing that he knows his stuff. Um, so with that said, I looked at 100 years of collective data and I used SPSS as my data calculator. And when I put everything in, I was able to refine it very, very clearly because I had everything by magnitude and date. And uh, what I had discovered was frequency patterns. And when I was looking at the ones and twos and threes, the small quakes that are happening every single day, I did discover that every two to three years there would be um, a cyclical shift. So we would have um, a little bit, a, a, a few more earthquakes, not really significantly, but every two to three years we would see more. So we had an increase in frequency, but the magnitude didn't come around until a 30 year peak cycle and the 30 year peak cycle for the magnitude, the frequency of magnitude happened in October of 2019. So even though we are expecting to see less earthquakes than say like when the volcano in Hawaii erupted and we were having like 5,000 or more earthquakes in a 24 hour time period. I'm not saying that's going to happen right now. Right now we're seeing maybe one or 200 in a 24 hour time period. What I am saying is the number or the, the magnitude of those quakes of those one or 200 quakes in that 24 hour time period, they will be a higher magnitude of quakes. So even though we were seeing you know, ones and twos and threes, we can expect to see fours and fives and sixes and sevens. And during the 30 year low of that cycle, we were only having, you know, maybe one 7.0 within any given three, one to three month time period. And now we're seeing sixes and sevens almost on a daily basis, if not daily. So my data specifically looked at the Cascadia subduction zone, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the Pacific Plate, because I live in the Pacific Northwest. I wanted to know um, if there was anything that could be predicted about where I live, because I'm kind of halfway between the subduction zone and Yellowstone, um, pretty much smack dab in the middle. And I need to know which way to go, right? Um, the predictability models of the 30-year cycle just peaked at October 19th. And I'm not saying that we are going to see a big eight or nine point, but I am saying that we can expect to see more sixes and sevens. And when I was looking at the Pacific Plate and the Strait of Juan de Fuca, 
the most probable point that the data pointed to was a couple hundred miles offshore and it put it offshore of Oregon, actually, not of Washington or California and, or Alaska, where we, where we tend to see a high frequency of low magnitude quakes. So we, we see them all the time in Alaska and the energy travels down and we see them in California all the time and the energy disperses. But ultimately, the magnitude, the high magnitude quakes were predicted to be a couple hundred miles offshore. Um, so it's not really anything you have to worry about unless it's so significant that it tri triggers some kind of tsunami warning. But still then, a couple hundred miles offshore, you're going to have a little bit of time to either seek shelter or, you know, take cover or get off the beach or whatever you need to do to get yourself to safety. Um, I just really want to bring it back into light because there's been a lot of increased magnitude quakes around the ring of fire and in the predictability models this has happened before starts in the in the southern area Papua New Guinea I mean they get a lot of quakes down there anyway but the magnitude increase should be present and quite apparent um, in our region too. So, you know, I'm not saying go out and, and spend two or $300 on groceries today and buy a generator and this and that. I'm just saying, if you go to the grocery store today, maybe pick up, spend an extra dollar and get an extra gallon of water and put it on your shelf because you know it's gonna be a lot harder to come by after the fact of a major event happening. So on that note, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me and my next video will be coming very, very soon. And just Christina signing out.